So open your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 12. And you'll also want to put something in Luke chapter 7. Last week during my message I said that we would begin at Romans chapter 12 and verse 16. And therefore, that's what we will do this morning. The verse said, Be of the same mind, one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. So there are actually four things in here that Paul is exhorting us to do. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things. Condescend to men of low estate. And be not wise in your own conceits. Now, to be of the same mind one toward another simply means that the things that you seek for your happiness, the things that you seek, seek the same thing for the other members in the body of Christ. We get that idea from the previous verse, verse 15, which said, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. So if someone is rejoicing, we rejoice with them. If someone is weeping, we weep with them. We seek the well-being of each other in the body of Christ. So be of the same mind as in there's a common bond that glues us together. There's something unique about the relationship that we have in the body of Christ. You know, my relationship with my brethren in Christ is completely different than my relationship with my siblings in the flesh. It's different. It's a different bond. It's a different union. It's different fellowship. Right? I mean, you all, you all can relate to that in, in your own lives. See, collectively, we come together, we share the gospel in hopes that, you know, people will get saved, people will come to the knowledge of the truth, people will see the Word of God rightly divided. I mean, we meet here every week because our goals are the same. We wouldn't be able to accomplish what we accomplish if everyone had a different agenda, right? If one person wants to do one thing and another person wants to do another thing, then that's not going to work. So we have to be of the same mind, one with another, and we reach people with the good news that we have. Now, something happened this past week and I'm referring to social media. I'm referring to Facebook, where I unfriended four people on Facebook. And I'm going to explain this morning why I did that and help everyone understand the reasoning behind the actions that I took, because it's very important. And someone may be saying, you're not going to name names, are you? Well, that's a good question. I'm going to use Paul as my example this morning. You know that Paul, in 2 Timothy, name, name, name two names in every chapter. People by name. That the people who were alive then knew exactly who he was talking about. So there is a place for naming names. For example, in chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, Paul named Phygelus and Hermogenes. In chapter 2, he named Hymenius and Philetus. In chapter 3, he named uh, Alexander and, uh, no, Janus and Jambres. And in chapter 4, he named Demas and Alexander, which did Paul much harm. And he's warning those believers in that day to be aware of them. To be aware of what they're, they're doing and what they're talking about. 
So I'm going to use Paul as my pattern in this this morning, and I will only mention their first names. Because that's what he did. And so those who are aware of what happened and what is transpiring in this social media thing will know who I'm talking about. Those who are not involved in the, in the whole thing, then don't worry about it. You don't need to get involved. You don't need to get involved in other people's problems and matters. But this past week, I unfriended Artie and Julie and Deb. And if he had been my friend, I would have unfriended Jerry P. And I'm going to share with you the reasoning why I did this. Our Facebook page, just like our YouTube channel, okay, we have two social media venues, so to speak, but both of those places are places of fellowship. They're places of edification. They're places of encouragement. If someone were to walk in our building this morning and have a seat, and then while, when I begin preaching, stand up and decide to create contention and division and strife because he did not agree with what was being spoken from this pulpit, do you know what would happen to that person? He would be escorted out the building. He would be removed from the premise if he were, if he were doing that. Because that's not the right thing to do. Well, it's the same thing with online fellowshipping. I don't go to YouTube channels where I know that I disagree with the content. I'm just not going to go there. There's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, I disagree, so why would I want to go? Can two walk together except they be agreed? First reason. Second reason is I don't want to go and create strife in somebody else's world. I don't want to do that. So I don't ask people in Facebook social media that I know disagree with me to become my friends. You know, I don't send them friend requests and say, hey, come on over. And for the life of me, I cannot understand why someone who doesn't agree with the dispensational truth that I hold to would want to become a friend with someone that they wholeheartedly disagree with. From what I can see, there's only one reason why a person would want to do that. They want to create strife and arguments and contention. There are people who thrive on things like that. They love to do that. So what does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say to do with that person? Well, Proverbs 22.10 says, Cast out the scorner, and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. Do we have examples of this in Scripture? I'll share one with you that's probably not commonly thought to be an example of this, but in his own personal life, the Lord Jesus Christ cast out scorners at one time in order to get some work done. Now you remember that Capernaum was the Lord's headquarters. That's where he ran his ministry from. Matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 1, it said that Capernaum was his own city. Three of the disciples came from Capernaum. That would be Peter, Andrew, and Matthew. All came from Capernaum. Capernaum was an important city. You'll remember in Luke chapter 7, verse 1, 
Now when he had ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this, for he loveth our nation and hath built us a synagogue. That man, that centurion, was now going to be blessed based on the Abrahamic covenant of Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, that promise that I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. That no longer is, is applicable for us today. Okay, you're not going to be blessed by blessing Israel. Because today there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. But back then, this man was going to be blessed. And not very long after this, his servant was healed. That's the centurion who built the synagogue. Then when you move over to Luke chapter 8, still in Capernaum, this time it's the ruler of the synagogue. And notice in Luke chapter 8, verse 41, And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house, for he had one only daughter, about 12 years old, and she lay a dying. This man is desperate. He only has one daughter, and she's dying, and he comes to Christ, falls down at his feet, okay, and he beseeches him to come to my house to heal my daughter. This story is about Jairus and his daughter. You have to remember that. But notice the verse goes on, but as he went, Jesus, as he went, the people thronged him. And he couldn't move. So Jairus is going, hey, you ever been in a traffic jam? You're on your way and you're in a hurry. All of a sudden there's a traffic jam. <laughs> right? And you can't go. That's Jairus. Hey, what are you people doing? Right? The bridge is up. You can't go. You're sitting there. That's Jairus at this moment. Think about that guy. His daughter is dying. This goes on to say, and a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, just like today. <laughs> Some things never change. Neither could be healed of any. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know, you know, you know how I feel about this subject. You're under the care of a physician. You're just going to get sicker and sicker. I've never met a person under the care of a physician who's getting better. Okay, I never have. But anyway, you know, the, the Bible confirms all this stuff, doesn't it? <laughs> right? So, and then it says, And came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude the multitude throng thee and press thee and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody hath touched me. For I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she's been exposed, she came trembling. And falling down before him, she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. This whole thing is transpiring while Jairus is like, Can we get to my house? Okay. And then the very thing that he fears... The very thing Jairus fears is this is taking too long. 
while he yet spake, Jesus, while he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Thy daughter is dead. Trouble not the master. And Jairus go, Jeepers, I knew it. I knew it. I knew this was going to happen. Right? Put your, I mean, just put yourself in, you ever put yourself in, 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 in the place of, sh in somebody's shoes in the Bible as something is happening? There, put yourself in Jairus' shoes right now. You've got daughters, you, right? And, and now you hear, the, she dead. Like, ay, 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 man. You people. She's probably started yelling at those people. Right? But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. And when he came into the house, he suffered no man to go in, save Peter and James and John and the father and the mother of the maiden. And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, weep not. She's not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, knowing she was dead. He was surrounded by a bunch of scorners. And what did he do? And he put them all out. Every one of them. And he took her by the hand and called, saying, Maid, arise. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat. And her parents were astonished. But he charged them that they should tell no man what was done. Listen, once the scorners had been banished, the Lord Jesus Christ went to work. He was able to do what he needed to do when they were absent. When they were out of the room. They were a distraction while they were there. The scorners. You see that? You see, scorners understand only one thing. They understand authority that shuts them up. And they understand authority that shuts them out. And that's what Jesus Christ did. And then once they've been silenced, something worthwhile can be done. Cast out the scorner and strife will cease. Fellowship can be enjoyed. Edification can be profitable. Encouragement can follow. But first, you must cast out the scorner. Because here's a principle whereby the scorner will operate. It's found in Proverbs chapter 26, verse 21. As coals are to burning coals. Now you remember those old uh, trains, the steam, steam engine? And that operated on coal. And when the coal got a little low, they had those big old shovels and they'd put coal on the, on the coal and that would reignite the coal, right? As coals are on coal and wood to fire. Everybody has sat in front of a fireplace and as the fire gets a little low, you put a, more log on it, you put another log on it and you reignite the fire. You keep it going. Well, as coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. A contentious man is quarrelsome. He loves to start a fight and he loves to keep it going. The thing that happened this week in social media was a man who hates dispensational truth who created a video about how wrong we all are, and then some people who I thought were dispensational jumped on board with him. And this man had put a post 
One of the posts that he said was, if anybody wants to discuss this video, I've got all day. That's what he said. And I said, well, I don't have all day to discuss what you're trying to do. And it happened to be like near my Facebook room and my Facebook page. So, boom, I booted him. And I booted the three other people that are, boom, 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 directly involved. The scorner and the contentious man are related to each other. They thrive on each other. They encourage each other. You cast them both out, and peace will be the inevitable result. And there's another verse that encourages us to do the same thing. I'm talking about Romans chapter 16 and verse 17. Now Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses. Now this word offenses, I hear a lot of preachers sometimes, and they say offense, offenses. An offense is when you have a basketball team, two basketball teams, one's on the defense, one's on the offense. That's offense. This is not offense. This is an offense. They cause divisions and off offenses. They're offending. There's a big difference between those two, offense and offense. Right? This is an offense. Contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and what do you do about them? Avoid them. You avoid them. Well, you know how you avoid them on social media? You cast them out. You cast them out. No questions asked. No explanation necessary. And definitely no apologies. No. You know, I don't have to explain to people why I unfriend them. They know what they did. They know what they're doing. And what they were doing got them booted, which means no more access to create division in a room or on a page or on a wall where people want to fellowship together and edify each other and encourage each other. Now listen, I am not talking about booting someone who is genuinely asking and genuinely seeking and asking the right questions. It is our responsibility to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. You know, the fellowship of the mystery. I love the fellowship of the mystery. The fellowship of the mystery is look around you, look next to you, look behind you, look in front of you. And you will see the fellowship of the mystery. On Facebook, right now, right this second, there are people, there's a whole list of people who have joined us this morning. There's a whole, I don't know how many there are, but there are many who have joined us this morning. Look at the names in that list, the people who have joined us, and you will see the fellowship of the mystery. We fellowship. We come together. Okay, we come to this place. We have people who join us by way of internet to fellowship around the mystery program that was revealed to the apostle to the Gentiles. If people don't agree with rightly dividing the word of truth, I encourage them, go somewhere else. I mean, go, I mean, I don't go to another church on Sunday morning because I wouldn't agree with them. Well, why would you come here? Why would you come to somebody else's Facebook page if you know you don't agree with them? You know, I'm not interested in arguing with people because here's the thing. I already know why you think what you think and I know why you think the way you do. I was there. You know, I was saved in a Pentecostal church. I was there for eight years. 
I was with the Nazarene Church for a couple of years. I was an independent fundamental Baptist preacher for quite a few years. I know exactly why you believe what you believe. I know exactly what it is you don't know. Now, you may not know what you don't know, but I absolutely know what you don't know. And I know, I know, I mean, I already know what you're going to say. I know what your pastor is teaching you. I know where he gets his denominationally charged, denominationally biased Bible teachings. I know where he gets them. So you can't come into my world and try to teach me that I'm wrong. I've already been where you are. And I left a long time ago. I know your reasoning. I know your arguments. I know your scriptural positions. I know why you hold them. I already know that. I don't need to sit here and argue with you about that. If you're not willing to learn from somebody who's already been in your midst and left, I'm sorry, I can't help you. But don't think you're going to drag me back into that mire of where you are now, because I already left that a long time ago. See, when I understood that God divided his Bible in time past, but now in ages to come, it set me free. When I understood that I have an apostle who speaks to me, who said I am the apostle to the Gentiles, that set me free. See, I would never go to a Mormon page and argue with them. I would never go to a Jehovah's Witness page and argue with them. I would never go to a denominational page, whatever denomination it is, and argue with them and try to convince them that they're wrong. I would never do that. Isn't there enough turmoil and trouble and fighting and chaos in the world now? Do I need to go somewhere and create more trouble and turmoil and chaos and fighting and contention and strife? Do I need to go do that? Well, if I don't need to go do it, why does somebody feel they need to come in my world and do it? If you come into my world and try to do that in my world, I'm booting you. But if you come in and you're seriously, earnestly wanting to know why I believe what I believe, I will gladly teach you because my responsibility is to make all men see. So I created a Facebook page and a YouTube channel for the purpose of edifying people who are of like mind and see the Word of God in the same dispensational way that I do. And if you don't agree with that, man, don't come here. You know? Don't come here. Don't come to my channel. Don't come to my... You know, I get, you know when I upload a video to YouTube... I have people sometimes who will leave comments that are very negative and they try to undo what I'm saying. I just, I remove it. Those things come to my phone. I see that thing right away. I read it. Oh, that's, good. that's nice. I just leave it alone. Some, if it's some guy who wants to be cantankerous, boop, remove, it's gone. I'm not dealing with them. I'm not going to argue with them. I, I, I've reached a place in my life I don't argue with people about doctrinal things anymore. If you want to argue, you'll have to find somebody else. Because I'm not arguing with you. Okay? I have so much information on the internet now that people can learn the word of God rightly dividing. I mean, our, our YouTube channel almost has a million views right now. I can tell you that thousands of people have come to understand the word of God rightly divided because of our YouTube channel, because of the preaching that comes from this room, from this pulpit. I can tell you that. I get emails and I get phone calls every single day of my life. Every day now, I get a phone call from somebody. Hey, I'm from here, I'm from there, I'm from here. I, I, I get called from Australia. From Australia. 
hey, brother, I, you know, you know how they, that nice accent they have. I, I don't even think I could reproduce it. Yay, yeah, mate. Yeah, yeah, yay, yeah, mate. Hey, I found right division, mate. Right? No, it's true. And, and I mean, I get phone calls from everywhere. And, uh, you know, and then we talk a little bit and I encourage them to keep going and, you know. But man, I'll tell you right now, you people who don't agree, go find those little groups that you do agree with and speak that which is good to the use of edifying among yourselves because that's the right thing for you to do so that you can go with groups that you are of the same mind with. That's the right thing for you to do. Don't come trying to create strife and division. You know, I'll say it again. We fellowship around the revelation of the mystery. You know, the mystery that was revealed to Paul is information that was kept secret back here. That's the mis that was a mystery back here, but it's been revealed and we fellowship around that mystery. That's why we're called in Ephesians 3, 9, the fellowship of the mystery. That's what we are. We're the fellowship of the mystery program. You know, there are people who actually fellowship around information that at one time was not made known to the sons of men. Information that since the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, but now has been revealed to the apostle, to the Gentiles, and we fellowship around the revelation of the mystery. Hence, we are called the fellowship of the mystery. So that's my understanding and my view of what a social media page should be like. It should be for the edification of the body of Christ. That's what it should be, be like. And if people want to come in and interrupt the peace and the tranquility and the joy and the love that we have in Christ, that can't happen. They have to be removed from my world because I can't have them there. I know that there are a lot of people who go to other groups. They go there intentionally. I'm talking about people who rightly divide. They go there and they try to change their mind. And then they find out that those people in those groups, their minds are set like a flint. Their, their heels are dug in the sand and they're, they're like set in their ways. And they go there, they argue. That's not, my, that's not my way of thinking to enjoy the Christian life. I don't have time to argue with people anymore. I'm too busy edifying, educating, encouraging, motivating you to continue and keep doing the right thing. That's what I'm about. And that's why. So... This verse, be of the same mind, one toward another. You know, last week we talked about the law of remote context. The law of remote context, that when you see something like this, you see a verse like this, and you want to understand it a little deeper, well, the answer will be found in the chapter that the verse is in. You read that chapter over enough, you'll find the answer that will shed more light on this and elaborate on it. That's called the law of remote context. If it's not in that chapter, it will be in the book that that verse is found in. Okay? Like, for example, being of one mind, notice in Romans 15, 5, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Now that's exactly like Romans 12, 16. But notice that, in order that ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the reason, here's the purpose why you want to be of one mind and be like-minded. That ye may glorify God. Arguing with people 
does not glorify God. It just creates contention and strife and name calling and every other ungodly thing that happens during these arguments in social media. Notice what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. He says, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Does that sound like Romans 12, 16? Yeah, absolutely it does. He says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. That's the opposite of those social media pages. That's just the opposite. Strife and vainglory is what predominates argument in, 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 in social media sites. And of course, I'm referring mostly to Facebook because I'm not on Instagram and Twitter and I'm not on any of those other things. I received an invitation once to... Some guy said to me, follow me on Twitter. I said, yeah, right. I don't follow people. I'm going to follow you. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't know. I, don't get, I don't get that, why anybody would want to go follow anybody else. Follow Paul as he follows Christ. That's what you need to follow. <laughs> right? Anyway, but in lowliness of mind... Let each esteem other better than themselves, condescending to men of low estate. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. This, this, this ver this, these verses in, in, encapsulate, they embody Romans 12, 16. It's an elaboration of Romans 12, 16. Look at verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 5 is an incredible statement. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Wow. That's Christ Jesus in the flesh, in his earthly life, in his ministry. What he did, what he thought, what he said, how he dealt with people. A good, a good demonstration of the mind of Jesus Christ is found in the high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. In the context of this, in the context of this, there's a prayer that Jesus Christ prayed where you see the mind of Christ. It was the prayer for his disciples and the requests he makes unto the Father are transdispensational. What he prays for his disciples in the Gospels is surely something that he wants for all those who claim Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. It's, it embodies what the Apostle is talking about when he speaks of being of the same mind. Here's what I mean. In John 17, verse 8, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. You know, Paul, Paul says, talks about this in uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, about receiving the word. And have surely, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Now notice specifically what he prays. Verse 21. That they... All may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. This is the heart attitude of verses in Philippians chapter 2 that we just read, and Romans 12, 16. Now, isn't it amazing that the Son of God prayed a prayer that wasn't answered. Everybody wants their prayers answered, right? Oh, I don't pray God's going to answer your prayers. This prayer concerning his disciples was not answered. You, re you, you realize that, right? And we, members of the body of Christ, 
are supposed to have this mind in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. And this prayer certainly is not fulfilled in the body of Christ. And I can say, it never will be fulfilled in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is so divided today that, I mean, there are so many denominations. It's impossible for this prayer to be answered today. Now, let me repeat that I realize that Jesus Christ is not praying for the body of Christ here in John chapter 17. But you have to know that this is something that he would want for anybody that follows him in any dispensation throughout time. And that's why Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The only way that there could be 100% unity in the body of Christ is if everyone obeyed Paul's instructions. It's the only way. If everyone obeyed the apostle to the Gentiles, especially if everyone obeyed 2 Timothy 2.15, then there could be unity in the body of Christ, but that will never happen, at least not on this side of eternity. This prayer in John chapter 17 is very similar to this exhortation in, in Romans chapter 12. Be of the same mind one toward another. Then he goes on, mind not high things. Mind not high things, which would be seeking after lofty positions. I remember not long after I was saved, I went to an event and we were in Fort Lauderdale, me and a couple of brothers in Christ. Some preacher was coming to town. We went to an auditorium. We were sitting there waiting for things to happen. And just as he was about ready to come on the podium to start preaching, I'll never forget the guy sitting in the front row right in front of us. And one of the guys said, I should be up there. I'll never forget that. I never forgot that. And I remember when I got home thinking about what he had said. And I was sorry that I had not said, that's why you're not up there. Because you think you should be. He minded high things. Position, authority, honor. That's what he wanted. His words demonstrated that was his heart attitude. Remember in Acts chapter 5, the, the, the leaders of Israel wanted to kill the apostles. Peter had already preached by the time we get to this verse. Then when they heard that, that's the leaders, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Then, then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among the people, among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Theodos, Theodos, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves. Who was slain? Thutis was slain. And all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to nothing. So here's a man who thought he was somebody, at least in his own mind. And he ended up dead. And the rest ended up scattered. And then the next verse, verse 37, after this, after this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. Taking a position of authority by force is a dangerous thing. Wanting a position of authority, desiring a position of authority 
is a dangerous thing. You know, I stand behind this pulpit every week. But it's not because I want to. This assembly began when I met Mark Johnson. Through Mark, I met Don and Pauline. Through Don and Pauline, I met Rita. Through Rita, I met those three people right there, Freddie, Doris, and Kenny. After I shared the gospel with them, they wanted to have Bible studies. We started having Bible studies. More people came. One thing led to another. But I never desired this position. I never desired it. I was thrust here by them. It's their fault. And then, and then the rest of you came around and you conspired with them to keep me here. And now every week, it's a conspiracy. You keep showing up. And I have to keep preparing messages to edify you and encourage you and help you in your understanding of the Word of God rightly divided. But it's not because I desire to be here. I don't desire it. I do it because I have to. Woe be unto me if I preach not the gospel is how I feel about it now. But it's not because I desire it. But I can tell you emphatically, it's your fault. It's not my doing. Now, thankfully, I believe in condescending to men of low estate. But you know what? That's why I stick around with you folks. Because in the process of everything that's going on here, Paul goes on to say in verse 16, Be not wise in your own conceits. Now, conceit is a favorable or self-flattering opinion of oneself. A lofty or vain conception of one's own person or accomplishments. People get proud of what they do and of what they have and of their accomplishments. And when, when you meet someone who you perceive to be of that lofty self-thinking attitude, you do say to yourself, boy, that person is conceited. You say that, right? We say that. Well, in light of the way this ministry began, as I just explained, it's very easy for me to not get conceited at all about what's going on here. I have nothing more than any other person sitting in this assembly right now. My attitude, and you've heard me say this many times in the past years, we be brethren. We be brethren. Okay? That's... That's how I've always looked at it. I mean, after our meetings on Sundays, 99.9% .9 of the time, we go to lunch. And as many of the people who are here, you're all, they're, everybody's invited to go. And then we just fellowship like normal brother and sister, like we really are in Christ. My position here has nothing to do with my life, after I walk out of this pulpit, then we're just, we're just brothers, you know that. We're just brothers and sisters, right? I mean, that's how, I, that's how I've always looked at it. And I'm also glad that no one here wants to be high-minded or wise in their own conceits and then take authority over business over which they have no business taking authority over. I'm glad that everybody here is of the same mind as I am. We are of the same mind in that way, right? We really are. This is a unique assembly. Now there's a man in 2 John whose name was uh, Diotrephes. And in verse 9 of 2 John, it's said of him that he loveth to have the preeminence. Uh-huh. Yeah, he was something. <laughs> there's a lot of pastors like that. 
Rita, Rita told me when we went to lunch last week that the pastor where she was at, when the service is ending, okay, and he says, bow your head, somebody else prays, and when they raise their heads, he's gone. He's gone. Why? Well, he can't, he, no, 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 I preach to you, we can't, we can't talk about anything now, huh? No, why? I'm here, and you're here. Di the spirit of Diotrephes is alive and well today, but it's a foreign spirit to what this is talking about. We quoted a while ago the, the verse, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That verse is an unbelievable. I want to look at it a little more closely. Now, he spoke to those who followed him. We know Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, but the instructions, the, the example of some of the things Christ did are extremely applicable. We don't confuse Israel's doctrine while they're under the law with the practical instructions for daily living that are transdispensational truth. You know, we know doctrine to Israel under the law. Well, we know that's not our doctrine. We're not under the law. But there are so many applicable things that happened in the Gospels that you go, that, that's good instruction. That I, I, let me give you some examples, okay? For example, in, Ma in Matthew chapter 11, 29, Jesus Christ said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Why? For I am meek and lowly in heart. That's always good advice. To be meek and lowly in heart and not exalt yourself. There wasn't a bone of pride in the Lord Jesus Christ. The life of Jesus Christ, in his life and in his death, are a rebuke to Adam's fallen children who are prone to every form of pride and conceit known to man. Let me remind you, before we look at some verses, of what conceit is. Again, conceit is a favorable or a self-flattering opinion of oneself. A lofty or vain conception of one's own person or accomplishments. Some men are conceited about their birth and their positions in life. It was said of the Lord Jesus Christ, Is not this the carpenter's son? This lowly person? Well, that's what they thought about him. Now, how wrong they were. How wrong they were. He's Mary's son. He's Mary's son. He's not the carpenter's son. He's Mary's son, and he's the son of God. So they were wrong there. The verse goes on to say, Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren... James and Joseph, Joseph and Simon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be a sister of Jesus Christ and grow up in his family? You ever wondered about that? Or one of his brothers? Yeah, there he goes again. Goody two-shoes. Yeah, he never makes a mistake, huh, Ma? Could you imagine that? Fallen children of Adam, the rest were. One is the holy, harmless, undefiled, separate son of God. Wow. Do you think he had any influence on his brothers and sisters? For good, we would love to know more about them, wouldn't we? We'd love to know more about his family life as he was growing up. The Bible inter interjects, intercepts his life at age 12 forward. 
We don't know before that. Right? We'd love to know. Well, I can tell you that in the end, he won them over. He won them over. Every one of them. In Acts chapter 1, right after Jesus Christ ascended and they watched him go to heaven, it says, Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they were come, come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zealots and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren, his family, were there. Yeah, he had an influence on them. But men looked upon him as the carpenter's son. Their, their focus was on the earthly side of Jesus Christ, and rightfully so, because how could they know? They rejected who he was. But men are also conceited in their wealth, proud of their wealth. It was said of Jesus, or Jesus said unto him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Men are also conceited about respectability. John 1, 46, And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? As they were telling him about Jesus. Philip saith unto him, Come and see. What about conceit of personal appearance? You know, some, some people who are born with great looks, some of them have a lot of pride about that. Right? Some of them have a lot of conceit about that. It was said of Jesus Christ, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we shall desire him, that we should desire him. Surely men have conceit of associations. And people who are their friends, hey, this is my friend. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. Are not men conceited about their education and their degrees? It was said of Christ, and the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters? having never learned. What about conceit of superiority? For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is, it, is not he that sitteth at meat? But I am among you as he that serveth. He wasn't concerned about superiority. What about conceit of success, or conceit of a position that a person holds? It's said of Jesus Christ, he is despised and rejected, a man of sorrows. What about conceit of ability? I don't need your help. I can do this myself. That's inbred in Adam's fallen children, isn't it? Jesus Christ said, I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. What about conceit of intellectualism? People are so smart. Right? Then said Jesus unto them, But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. See, what, what does the believer do? We shun the propensities of fallen Adam that we gravitate 
towards these things of conceit. We're prone to self-exaltation, self-worship, self-glorying. What do we do instead? Be not wise in your own conceits. This one phrase is found seven times in your King James Bible. That's number one. Second place is found in Romans 11.25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Be not wise in thine own eyes is, the, is the, being wise in your own conceits. It embodies the concept of conceit. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits. Or his own conceit. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. You know, there are people who understand why they believe what they believe. And then there is this sluggard who doesn't study, who comes along, says, I don't agree with that. But and yet a man can render the reason why he believes what he believes. But the sluggard will be wiser in his own conceit. The rich man is wise in his own conceit. The poor that hath understanding searcheth him out. That means that, you know, I used to share, I used to share, I'm, I'm done by the way. I used to share that, you know, a believer can look at an unsafe person and know what makes an unsafe person tick. But an unsafe person cannot look at you and understand what makes you tick and make you the way you are. You know, it's like if you stand in a dark room and you hold a flashlight, you can see the person, but he can't see you. You can search him out, but he cannot search you out. We're guilty of many of these things. Things before we're saved. Hopefully, hopefully, we stop being wise in our own conceit. This is what demonstrated to man how God hates conceit and pride and sin. This is where God put an end to it in Jesus Christ. You know, we sit here today, we're saved, people in this room. I wonder how many people watching by way of internet, you don't even know what this means. You don't even know what happened here. You think that you're going to bypass this and walk straight into heaven based on what you have done, not realizing that this is where the penalty for your sin was paid. This is the only place where God accepts anything for man. Right here, the cross. This is what God accepts in exchange for the gift of eternal life. As the responsibility of every fallen child of Adam is to come to the cross as a sinner and say, Lord, I'm guilty. I receive the forgiveness that you offered on this cross. I believe that you died, that you were buried, and that you rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And I'm trusting that for the forgiveness of my sins. That's what God accepts. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it was through what happened here, through Jesus Christ here, that God accepts us. You know, the Bible says we're accepted in the beloved. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior today, I pray that you will bow your heart before God the Father and let your faith rest on the cross, on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you can be a possessor of the free gift of eternal life which God promised before the world began. Amen?
All right, let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, we're thankful this morning for the great salvation that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful that He allowed Himself to be nailed to a cross where He bled, died, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And by simple faith in that work, we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of thy grace. I pray this morning, Lord, that if anyone doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they will bow their heart before the God of creation and acknowledge their guilt and believe that Jesus Christ died for them, was buried and rose again, and let their faith rest upon that for the forgiveness of their sins. I pray these things today in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.